and then see how it goes. I think it should be okay. Brilliant, thank you. So, good morning. We have Andrew Tate um, from Preston Reeves here today. Uh, it's business resilience and contingency planning. And actually, we've been having quite a good conversation uh, in the room, which I think we could probably could continue here. Um, just about how, I mean, Andrew, if you want to introduce yourself and just talk about actually how you've seen business uh, within the last, you know, two years now with COVID and, and what that, what impact that, what you've seen and what the impact is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good, good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Tate. I am a partner at Crescent Reeves and I'm the uh, head of restructuring. Uh, so, so restructuring um, being uh, anything from sort of helping businesses that might uh, need to restructure themselves from a tax point of view or through to companies that are actually in distress and, and in crisis. Um, I, I'm, I'm a liquidator. Uh, as, as part of my role so uh, so the, the full gambit um what what have i seen well it's it's been a really fascinating time because when we got through to march last year um everybody who does my does my sort of job um actually thought oh my goodness you know this is this is going to be an absolute killer for businesses uh, and and many firms actually geared up uh, there was, there's a huge amount of movement in our market where uh, people were moving from one company to another uh, where companies were thinking right you know we need to get ready for the on the deluge of, of companies that are going bust uh, and uh, and actually it didn't happen uh, and obviously the government stepped in with with furlough uh, with with all the c bills loans bounce back loans etc and uh, and actually the, the 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 numbers of company that were going bust actually fell uh, during the, the, the time uh, rather than going the other way. And that's that's still pretty much the case. Um, businesses are, are actually doing really well. We hear about a lot of people who still got a lot of cash in the bank uh, from the C-bills and bounce back loans that they had. So, so it's been a really interesting time uh, where we, we did see a, a flurry of businesses at the beginning uh, that were really teetering on the edge anyway. Uh, and that, that really thought that they should probably just do something about it before it got too too bad. Um, but but since then, there have been particular businesses that that have been hit by the pandemic. Uh, so we, we've seen one, for example, uh, that, that was a, an exchange, a student exchange company. Well, obviously, you know, students are not going to be traveling from Europe into, into the UK anytime soon for exchange visits. Uh, maybe it will start in 2022, but it was at the death knell for, for, for that business. Um, uh, uh, other ones are charities um, where actually their funding has dried up and, and they haven't been able to, to, to get the funding that they need. And, and it's not it's not always. Um, you know, a, a disaster uh, that it is possible to recover from these things. Um, but but really, it's a it's been an education business is trying to actually um, it, what we're going to talk about today to, to look at um, their future to, to, to be able to forecast where they might see the pinch points and uh, and then to be able to, to try and survive uh, through this. So it's 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 a really interesting time. Having said that, I don't think it's going to get any easier for businesses. I think there's uh, there's huge conflicting signs out there, um, which is which is very difficult for businesses to navigate. Absolutely. Um, okay, so um, Andrew, let's let's start with the slides. Of course, it's been recorded right. as well, so this will go online. Um, right. So yes, so uh, I will share my screen. Brilliant. Thank you. So can everybody see that? We can. Um, I think you're in, um, it's, I don't know if it's in presentation mode. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, no. Um, hang on a moment. Let me just do that again. Is that one better? That's perfect, perfect, perfect. Richard, can I just ask, um, sorry, Andrew, Richard, where are you from, Richard? Uh, Stafford Perkins, we're a firm of charter surveyors in Ashford. Uh, Fantastic. So okay. the, the local lads um, deal with receivership work as well. Brilliant, great, that's good. Great, learning from each other, love, love that. Okay, <laughs> over to you, Andrew. Great, thank you. Well, Richard, I'll be very interested in your input during this. <laughs> Please do. Let, let us share, share your experiences. Uh, okay, 
so yes, yeah, so that's me, um, uh, head of restructuring at Creston Reeves. Um, the, the idea of, of, of today is to help businesses um, uh, with current circumstances, uh, remembering to take a step back and look to the future. And I think it's really that that sort of future proofing, um, you know, looking at the at, at what's likely to be coming up in the future, which is, is so important. Um, really looking at um, uh, agility through funding, making sure that the cash is there uh, for, for whatever your business needs in the future. Um, Re resilience and actually that should be contingency planning not consistency planning big pardon um, crisis planning and management uh, which is really where uh, I, I get involved with things uh, many times uh, and the importance of looking at the opportunities in a crisis as well Brilliant. Um, I just thought it would be helpful to set the scene um, so quite a few quite a few people in in uh, in my world, who, who do the sort of work that I do, um, it, it really bugs me because they uh, they, they post things onto to LinkedIn, um, which are basically, uh, in a sense, celebrating the bad news, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that really really bugs me because actually, uh, you know, we're all in this economy. We all want uh, the very best for the economy, and there's always going to be business failure. I just don't think that you know people should actually be uh, crowing about it. So I, I thought it would just be useful in setting the scene, in looking at the positives, because there are some real positives out there, uh, perhaps looking at where the threats might, might come as well. So on the positive side, the thumbs up side of, of this slide, um, we've got, you know, the positives. We're all getting out and about. Uh, social activities are increasing. Uh, that's you know producing revenue for the for the economy. Uh, GDP is you know is is bouncing back well, um, and, and ultimately we're all getting back to work as well. We're we're getting back to our offices. Um, you know I think there's still a bit of an issue around city centres, but I think London's busier than it, it certainly has been uh, in, in the last um, in, in the last eighteen months. On the funding side of it, um, we've obviously had the C-bills, the bounce back loans, the grants, and that really means that a lot of businesses have actually got cash in the bank um, ready to take on the challenges that are coming through. Um, th there isn't really that much pressure from banks. Uh, banks are being very uh, sensitive to, to business, uh, businesses that might be having difficulties, um, and that's really led by the, uh, the British um, Business Bank. Uh, they, they've been leading the way on that. And HMRC have also been helpful, um, really, really trying to support businesses by time to pay arrangements if they need them or, or deferring tax payments or VAT payments. So, so you've got all of that really positive stuff, which is helping businesses to, uh, to be able to, 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 to see their way through and have confidence in the future. Um, but, but there are some negatives and we, we, we need to just uh, remember them. The supply chain, I think there's more and more, um, uh, uh, there's more and more coming through in the media about what the supply chain issues are. And um, I, I know, uh, you know from personal experience of, of businesses that are really, really suffering um, with supply chain issues. And, and by supply chain issues there, I mean uh, things coming across from China on the freight. Uh, you know, freight prices have gone up. Uh, the the delays with with um, uh, container ships being in the wrong place, etc. That really is um, uh, hitting home. Um, I, there's a business. Uh, my my partner works for a business uh, which is uh, supplying to the automotive. Uh, industry and uh, they found their lead times have shot up from 24 weeks to over a year uh, for parts so when, when you're supplying automotive which is just in time that's really really difficult to manage um, so all sorts of implications there um, we hear about energy costs going up uh, and that's going to hit, hit businesses um, we can't get people and uh, we've just read read today in in the paper that uh, that the the number of va job vacancies in the UK is at the highest level I think that it's ever been uh, of over a million on, on official statistics, and obviously we've, we've read about raw materials uh, costs going up, um, wood, and and that sort of thing. And somebody actually made a good point to me the other day that actually, um, you know, even in the in, in the sort of supply chain, um, you know, you need wood to make pallets. And actually, so the cost of your pallets, uh, you know, goes up uh, along with everything else. It's not just actually the timber that we need to build houses and uh, all that sort of thing. So there's this, you know, quite a lot of implications there. And really, what's the implications of that? Um, that means that margins are getting squeezed. 
Uh, so profit margins are definitely under pressure in businesses which are impacted by this stuff. Um, cash, therefore, is is getting is perhaps getting tighter. Um, and, and, and that may not be an immediate thing, but if this continues, then, then businesses are going to need more money and more working capital. And then, of course, we've got the, uh, the tax rises, which were announced a few days ago, which is, again, going to, to hit us. And all of, the, all of that on the negative side, uh, I think there's a danger that that, that leads into inflation. Uh, which and, and, and uh, you know what people say is that when inflation actually starts to be wage inflation, uh, then that becomes quite difficult to manage because uh, you, you get into a bit of a cycle, which I, I don't think we've really seen since the 1970s. So, so that's really setting the scene. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's got any any other um, you know uh, things that they have seen, which perhaps I haven't put onto the slide. Um, which would be useful to consider, but uh, it's certainly yeah. a very mixed position. Yeah, I think you've covered that well, Andrew. I mean, it's it's interesting actually about you know saying about inflation. I mean, would you suggest that that is a bad time to invest then, or you know, what would you is is cash king at the moment? You know. It, it, you know, it, it's a really difficult one. When, when, you, when you look at the impact of inflation, uh, you know, obviously the money that we have in the bank, uh, if, if inflation uh, continues to, to, to rise and, and gets to high levels, what we've got in the bank is not going to buy us as much in the future uh, as that it would do if inflation was low. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's going to be a, an issue for us. Um, on the other side of it, if, if you're investing in something which is going to appreciate quickly, so you know we've seen that the boom in the property market, um, you know Richard might might know more about that. Uh, then you know bricks and mortar have all have always seemed to be a good in, uh, a good investment, provided that we don't have a bubble that bursts. Then you know you may find that your your money invested in bricks and mortars or or you know similar. Uh, investments in shares where perhaps you know that's in the background is a good investment but but certainly i think i think generally inflation is um it is a real concern because you know the value of our pensions the value of our our salaries in real in real terms will be going down if if, in, if inflation takes off yeah absolutely um so, so it's, you know, it's an interesting scenario. As I say, it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. I think the fact that we are actually getting back to business, I think the UK uh, generally is in a good position. Um, being able to, uh, you know, get out, out of our country when we need to, to be able to, to get back to work. Um, and, and all of the economic activity that we've got, I think, is absolutely fantastic compared to perhaps some other countries in the world. Um, but we just have to be have to be uh, aware of the the, the, the pr I would say the pressure on profits, which is which is uh, some businesses are feeling already, and I think probably others will. Yeah, and and and, and this is quite right to be talking to the, about this, obviously, because it's contingency planning. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, okay, so so let's let's just move forward. Um, retaining agility through funding. Um, so. The key question is here, do you have a cash contingency fund? Uh, so businesses need to think about, um, you know, what they've got in the event of um, uh, that, that, that problems come along. And as I said uh, before, many businesses we hear, uh, we hear from the banks um, that actually, uh, whilst I think the UK, the UK drew down something like 86 billion um, in, in loans and grants and, and bounce back loans uh, from the government. And, and quite a lot of that cash uh, we hear is actually still in bank accounts, untouched and um, almost ready for a rainy day. Mm. Um, we hear the stories that some people have gone on a bit of a spending binge uh, with, with the money. Uh, and there's absolutely no doubt that some businesses will have had to actually spend uh, the money that they got just keeping their business ticking over. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically around hospitality um, and those sorts of related businesses where they simply could not operate. And even when they got back to operation, uh, they couldn't have the number of people within their premises to, to generate a profit. So, um, so, so there will be winners and losers, um, but we do hear that quite a lot of businesses have got this money. So I think it's, real, it's a real question for businesses. Do they actually have a cash contingency fund um, uh, available to them? 
and um, a, a general rule of thumb is to have enough cash to cover about three months of operating expenditure. Uh, that just gives you a buffer where hopefully if something comes along and hits you, uh, then then actually you've got three months to be able to sort it out um, without getting uh, to, to the point where you know, perhaps you can't pay the bills as they go along. Um, different businesses will di will have different needs. Um, we, we talked about charities earlier. Uh, I've, I've spoken to charities in the past where you know there are people involved in charities who simply do not want to take any risks and that's perfectly understandable uh, so we do find that the that, that charity clients actually um, want to have a, a very comprehensive what we call a reserves policy uh, so they want to have enough money in the bank uh, or access to money so that actually if something catastrophic happened and they decided they couldn't go on uh, that they have enough money to be able to you know pay any redundancy costs that are there, uh, pay off any lease liabilities that there might be, uh, and, and they can wind down the business uh, and be able to pay everybody off and hold their heads up high. Um, in, in, in commercial operations, uh, where perhaps margins are quite tight, um, that's not always possible. And it doesn't mean that that's wrong, it just means that there's a, a, a greater appetite for risk uh, for, for businesses. So, uh, so, so three months is a rule of thumb, but depending on the business that you're in, it, it, it could be more or less. Um, we, we know from a personal point of view that, uh, you know, good, good financial um, prudence is also from a, a household point of view to have enough money in the bank to be able to sort of, you know, get through, say, three months of, uh, of household expenditure. Um, a lot of people can't do that. Um, it's perhaps a, a, bit of a, a bit of a wish, but it's, uh, it's, it is prudent. Uh, to, to try and get to that position. Absolutely. Um, so things to consider around funding. Um, many of the government back schemes, the, the C bills, the bounce back loans, these have finished. You can't uh, can't tap into them any any further. But obviously, the loans that have been given there are, are um, payable over six years. Uh, in some cases, even extended to, to ten years. But there is this, uh, this new scheme which was introduced by the government earlier this year in March, uh, which is called the Recovery Loan Scheme, uh, and that's available uh, until December. And businesses can apply under the Recovery Loan Scheme, um, even if they've had a C-bills or a bounce-back loan, uh, so they can still access that. It is slightly different um, in that actually the rate of interest that you would pay on a recovery loan that you took from your bank um, is, is going to be perhaps higher than was the case under C-bills and bounce back loans, which had very low interest rates uh, fixed for the, for the term. Um, so these interest rates might be, might be higher, um, but, but some of the, the benefits still apply where if you were going for a, a loan that was less than 250,000 pounds, then the bank wouldn't be asking for a personal guarantee. Uh, so it, it's something which is available. I don't think there's been a great take up of it uh, by businesses from, from what we hear, uh, but it's certainly there if, if people think that they're going to need extra funding. And given that it's going to end in December, it's certainly worth making an application for it if businesses feel that it, it could help them get through next year. Um, Andrew, extensive... sorry, is that, is, that, is that through the bank that you can... Is it... Yeah, it is. Yeah, so so it's a, it's an application through uh, your normal bank or one of the banks that uh, has signed up to this scheme, uh, and there are many of them. And um, again, it is government backed, uh, and I think it's very important for people to understand uh, what that actually means. I'm sure Richard's probably seen people who get a little bit confused as to what this government backing actually means. Uh, the, the government backed schemes. Uh, what what it really means is that um, if 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 the bank gives you a loan, let's say a bounce back loan of, of fifty thousand uh, pounds, then if if the if that needs to be recalled uh, because the business ceases to trade or goes bust or something like that, and um, there's a lot of confusion because it, it doesn't mean that the government just steps in and and pays eighty percent of the loan back. Uh, actually, the bank has an obligation to get as much money back as it can from the company uh, or, or the business that's been operating by 
selling the assets, collecting any any debts that might be due, um, and, and and collecting that in. So the bank has an obligation to get as much money as it possibly can. And it's only at the end of that, when the bank's exhausted all avenues, that the government will step in and, and pay 80% of what's left. Um, so that, that's really valuable support. It encourages the banks to, to lend money. Um, and it's the set, that's the same with the recovery loan scheme. But Thank it's you. definitely through the bank. Yeah. Brilliant. So Thank the you. first point of call is, is to talk to the bank. Um, the second point there is extending the lending term. Uh, I mentioned that a moment ago, uh, when C-bills and bounce back loans first came in, uh, the, the, the term was six years. You can apply for them to be uh, repaid over, over 10 years uh, through an application to the bank. Um, number three is, is pay as you grow. Uh, a little bit of an odd title this. Basically what it means is that if you've got a C-bills loan or a bounce back loan, uh, you can actually apply to the bank uh, to only pay interest for six months, and you can do that three times through the the period of the loan. Um, so it's uh, it, it, it's an interesting term. It's quite a, a, an attractive um, uh, sort of headline that the typical Boris. Um, but what it means is that you can actually uh, have a capital payment holiday for six months. Um, we'll come back to scenario planning, uh, but but basically what we're saying here is if you are approaching a lender. Just make sure that you're properly prepared, and that you've done your scenario planning. You know what you're talking about. Um, think about Dragon's Den. Uh, think think about uh, you know what sort of questions might come back from the bank, and make sure that you're properly uh, prepared before you go in and, and make an application to the bank or, or speak to to a bank. Um, and and it, it 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 can be helpful. I would say this, but it can be helpful to get a financial advisor uh, just to to look over uh, what is being submitted uh, to make sure it makes sense um, and, and the other side of this is review your growth plans and um, so if a business is going to grow and clearly there are lots of opportunities out there at the moment uh, with the demand that we're all seeing uh, but businesses do need to make sure that they've got the working capital to be able to support their growth and um, otherwise you can find that you know take on more and more orders and it's absolutely fantastic and we hear about uh, we, we hear about um, you know building firms that, that um, du during the, the the summer months have, have taken on a lot of work they then struggle to find people to um, to, to do that work or they struggle to, to, to make the payments to suppliers um, on time because they've stretched themselves too thinly. So if, you, if you're thinking about growing and taking advantage of that, just make sure that you, you know what the cost of that is going to be. Anybody got any questions or, or comments around that? Uh, does that all make, all make sense? Yeah, I think so. No, no, everyone's quiet. I think you're doing, covering it off very well. Excellent. Excellent. A, a, a star, Andrew. A star. <laughs> Brilliant. Can, um, can I ask, is the um, three pay as you grow, is that interest alone? Is it? Do you have to pay that interest at the end or is it, to, is it just disappear? Uh, so so the, the, the pay as you grow, the, 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 three, the, the idea is that you... you in normal circumstances, you'd be paying capital back to the bank and the interest. Yeah. Yeah. So what it allows you to do is to simply pay the interest for six months so that you're not having to make the capital repayment. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so it's, uh, it's just allowing you pay, to pay the interest. You must pay the interest, but it's, it's giving you a capital repayment holiday. So um, it, it lengthens the, the payment that you've got to pay eventually then? Yes, yes. So you do have to pay it back. You, you still have to pay it. It's just a, a help for, for cash flow. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And, and, and obviously, if you if you took a, a capital repayment holiday uh, for, for six months, then ultimately the amount of interest that you're going to pay across the, the whole of the loan is probably going to be a bit more because you've got more yeah. capital outstanding for longer. Fine. So yeah. you, you don't get out for now. <laughs> no, afraid not. Afraid not. No, right. not. And, and that, that's what that is one of the things, uh, you know, with this whole scenario. There's, there's been lots of grant funding, but so much of the, the help that's been given ultimately is, is loans and deferments of payments. So, uh, you know, it's it's really sort of pushing that um, pushing that pain down the, down the road. 
Um, and to a certain extent, that's kind of what's happening with our with the government as well, isn't it? You know, we're now seeing the tax rises, uh, which are paying for the uh, the spending that we had during the pandemic. So, um, so there's the grant funding for business has been absolutely fantastic. But uh, there's there's a lot of businesses coming out of um, the the last eighteen months uh, with a lot more debt than they went into it with, and and that's uh, that's just something that needs to be recognised. Okay, um, so I, th I think just moving on to, to crisis planning uh, and management. Uh, so I I've got a few slides on this. Uh, and again, very, very happy for, for people to ask any questions um, as we go along. Uh, so th this, what, what I look at, you know, how do we take a, a strategic approach uh, to a crisis? Um, business gets into a, a crisis and it it sometimes feels for business owners that you know the weight of the world is on their shoulders uh, it's just too difficult nobody uh, really contemplates going into business uh, or, or even in a personal life and not being able to pay their bills um, you know we're, we're all wired uh, to, to to do the honorable thing but the fact is that the businesses do get into crisis and sometimes uh, you know, they simply couldn't see that uh, coming down the line. So it is useful in that situation to take a step back, try and see what the strategic approach to coming out of it actually is. Um, so we say there's, there's two aspects of that. There's financial planning and there's operational um, aspects of it as well. So financial is looking at your scenario planning, uh, looking into the future, how, how might you come out of, of this crisis? And on the operational side, look at you know, your revenues, look at your cost base and see how you can best match them um, to, to make sure that the position doesn't get worse. Um, examine the risks. Um, and clearly at the moment, there are lots of external risks out there and that's um, that the, the classic analysis of that is, is called a pest analysis. Uh, political, economic, social, and technological. All of those factors are very, very much out there at the moment um, with, with bringing influences and impacts on businesses. So it's uh, very important to, to look at the wider um, scenario and then to be able to model scenario planning. And, uh, and, and what we say in that is uh, scenario plan for what you can see in your head, you know, might be the situation for your business for the next 12 months. But actually, let, think about some extremes as well. Nobody could predict a, a pandemic coming along. Yeah, well, perhaps one or two people could. I think mean, Bill Gates uh, and, and, and people like that could, could see it sort of coming down the line. But uh, most, for most of us, it wasn't on our radar. So actually look at scenario planning, and we'll, we'll look at this a little bit further in, in future slides. Um, and, and, and then um, really have a look at, um, you know, how you can sort of be be um, flexible in, in your um, in your policies. So let's move on to the next slide. So operational challenges. Um, this is this is what you know. You're in the middle of a crisis, and you're finding that, that you know you're you're running out of money. Um, okay, what what do you do? You need to protect your income as as far as possible. Uh, so ultimately, if you need, you know, if you've got uh, scarce resources, uh, you need to be trying to plough those into maintaining your your income sources uh, as best you possibly can. Uh, so get that revenue coming through, keep the business open as much as possible, um, have stock to be able to sell. You know, those sorts of things are really important. And we say that the next point is provide a longer runway into a crisis as possible. So very often business owners that get into difficulties bury their head in the sand. They don't know what to do. Um, they, they, they know there's a deep, you know, deep down in them, there's a problem, but actually they just don't know what to do about it. So they bury their head in the sand, don't talk to anybody about it. Um, but then something happens. And, uh, you know, whether it's somebody, um, you know, issuing a court summons uh, and getting a CCJ or um, a supply that's stopping supplies or um, HMRC sort of starting to, to knock on the door. So we, we don't want to be starting to address a crisis when those things happen. Uh, ideally, we want to try and look at them uh, at an earlier stage. And 
big companies that, that borrow money from banks, they have covenants. Um, they have covenants around um, balance sheet strength or, or share price and that sort of thing. And, and the, the idea of these covenants is actually to give the bank a really a, a, an early warning that a company's got difficulties uh, long before it actually happens. So even with smaller businesses, uh, you know, to provide a, as long a runway into a crisis as possible just means that there are more options available uh, to, to think about. Um, at an early stage. Now, it's easier said than done. Uh, you don't necessarily see these things coming through. Um, but this is really why forecasting and sitting and thinking about what's coming down the line is so important. Um, communicating with stakeholders. Um, so I, again, people will tend to sort of bury their head in the sand. You know, the, the phone starts ringing from suppliers, you know, wanting to know when they're gonna get paid. And it becomes really, really stressful because clearly, you know, those people want to know what's going on and they want to know what's going on. But if you tell them the truth that you're starting to struggle, then actually they might stop supplying and that's going to make your problems even worse. So it becomes really difficult for people to uh, to manage it. And um, we, we actually find and we're a firm of accountants and we find the clients who really, really need to talk to us about sort of where their business is. Uh, they get scared about talking to us if they haven't paid a, a bill. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so you can find that, you know, something happens to a client and you didn't know that they had problems because they've gone quiet. And, and that's just the worst thing that can happen. Uh, people also worry about talking to a bank because they think, oh, you know, if I talk to the bank about the problem, they're going to pull my overdraft facility or, uh, you know, something like that. And again, the bank manager would much prefer to know at an early stage if there are issues. Uh, because they then they then know that there are some options to help as well. So, Absolutely, uh, I think that's a really valid point, Andrew. I mean, finance is 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 the number one thing, isn't it, that people will bury their head in sand? I mean, for, I, I'm I'm the world's worst. We, I'm, I, you know, with that myself. So I, I completely uh, completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, with it. <laughs> yeah. It, it is, and and. You know, and it, as I say, the thing is that that actually we're all wired to pay our bills, uh, you know, right from an early, early age. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, when, when we get um, financial um, education, whether it's from our parents or from school or, or elsewhere, people are saying, you know, um, live within your means, uh, make sure you can pay your bills, etc. And it's in built into us. And so actually, sometimes the absolutely right thing for individuals or businesses is to say you know what i can't do this and actually I, I i just need to accept the fact that that i can't i can't do it and and actually not really get bogged down with the stigma of it yeah, um, but it's it's really difficult for people to uh, to, to be able to, to wrestle with that um, yeah absolutely and, 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 and the thing is from a business owner especially you know if you if you think about a director of a limited company you know, a, a director of a limited company. Okay, they may be uh, they may be a shareholder uh, of the company. They may own the business, but ultimately, uh, somebody who's investing their time into a business. Uh, you know, we've only got so many years on the planet. Uh, we've only got so many years to to earn an income, and if somebody is working for a business that's got into a really difficult position, where in reality, it's going to be really it's going to be a long time to come out of it. They may find that they're working for five years just to pay off bank liabilities or money to other people um, that, that it is owing not from any action that they've taken. And so I, I sometimes say to directors, you know, you need to take a step back and think about, um, you know, are, are you doing your yourself and your family any favours really by continuing to try and, you know, claw this business or actually would the would the economy and, uh, and and your your own family be better off by just saying you know what it's time for a fresh start this has gone wrong i need to recognize that actually that's the case take responsibility for it Absolutely. but actually you've just got to have a step back sometimes yeah very very wise words andrew and <laughs> and and especially directors i mean they they you know, they're putting so much of their time, so much of their life into this business, 
and sometimes the acceptance part is the hard part but of course as you said is is the correct way forward yeah yeah absolutely i mean you know in the state sometimes there uh, there's perhaps a slightly different view of it you know people say if you haven't been through you know a couple of bankruptcies uh, as a as a, an executive you haven't lived um we we don't have that view uh, but actually the uk has come such a long way from you know perhaps uh, 100 or 200 years ago where you know people were thrown into prison uh, for owing money uh, and a number of times I have people, uh, you know, coming to me to say, oh, you know, my, my limited company owes money to the revenue. Am I going to go to jail? Uh, you know, people actually do say that and it just doesn't happen. Um, yeah. Obviously, this has been fraud or something like that, different kettle of fish, but, you know, normal business problems. Um, that's just not the case. And, and, uh, but, but, but people get themselves worked up into, into such a skew about it. It's, it's very sad. Yeah, absolutely. And the final point on this uh, slide is just don't compromise on health and safety. Um, you know, there's there's absolutely no point uh, with that at all. Uh, and, and and particularly at the current time, or certainly over the last 18 months, you know, that's been quite a dilemma uh, for, for businesses. You, you just can't compromise on that stuff. It's, uh, it's very short-sighted. Excellent. So just wanted to talk about scenario planning. Um, we, 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 Crescent Reeves have been talking throughout the pandemic about businesses um, forecasting their future. Um, whether that is uh, a really complicated financial model uh, where you've got a cash flow that's integrated with a profit and loss account that's integrated with a balance sheet, that's the nirvana. Um, but actually, a, a business just uh, mapping out what the next uh, the, the next six months look like from a cash flow point of view is um, is is really helpful. The thing is, people will try and do that in their heads, um, and and ultimately, when you actually put the numbers into a, a, a spreadsheet, even if it's a simple spreadsheet, you can actually see the reality that's there, and it it, it doesn't it cannot come out um, accurately in just imagining it in your head. So people have run businesses for a long time, um, you know, whether it's retailers or whatever, you know, they'll have an idea in the head of what, what revenue they need to have coming in, what their break even point is. But actually, if you want a scenario plan, you just need to get it down in writing somewhere and, uh, and run the numbers. Um, we've actually found that people generally haven't really engaged with that message. Uh, and that, that's a bit of a worry because it means that people are um, not necessarily thinking as deeply as they need to about the challenges that might come ahead. Um, when scenario planning, look at the realities, make some assumptions uh, about what you think about the future, write them down, challenge them, and in a sense, think outside the box. Um, think about things that could come along that, that you know you may not be able to control uh, and, and and think about how you would actually um, deal with that. Um, we, we merged with the business um, in 2016, which was a firm of accountants in, uh, in, in Sussex. They had one of their offices burned down 10 years beforehand, um, be, before we had all of this sort of online um, you know, data backups, et cetera. And, uh, and they cope with it. But actually, could they really anticipate that that was going to happen? You know, it's uh, not unless you really sit down and, and perhaps sit down with somebody else and chew the cud and think about, you know, what could potentially come in the in the future. It's, it's really helpful to do that. And um, bring it back to basics, focus on the main drivers. Um, think about you know your 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 basic business model. Think about your your basic revenues and what your cost drivers are. Um, if you're forecasting, just bring it back to basics and make sure you understand how your business um, cycle works. Um, we say think about best case, medium case, and worst case. Um, hopefully, the best case will work. Um, generally, businesses you know um, who who aim for really high growth we aim for the sky they can do really well um you've got to have that that vision that enthusiasm to to try and get the best out of of your work as, as possible um so but keep it simple don't try and focus on too much at, at uh at one time um 
think about one scenario at a time and, and try and model it. Okay, just move on to the next one. Um, so we're just talking about the worst case, we've, we've talked about this. Um, uh, think about the triggers uh, of when you might need to speak to somebody else, whether it be the bank manager, your accountant, just think about um, what at what point you might say, you know what, I think I just need to talk this through with somebody else. Um, and that's a, that's a really responsible thing uh, to do. What's the point of no return? You know, if, if a business is starting to get into difficulties, at what point do you actually just stop and say, you know what, uh, this is this is not working. Uh, I need to hold my hands up and actually see what the options are. Um, we've talked about cash flow scenario planning. Um, if a business is in, in a crisis, then actually the, uh, the, the, the considered wisdom is that you should have a weekly rolling cash flow uh, for 13 weeks, which is basically three months. Um, uh, and businesses that, that need to manage their cash very carefully will we'll do weekly cash flows, looking at the money coming in, looking at what money you need to pay out uh, and making sure that over that, that three month window, uh, you've got a really good picture. We talked about a wind down reserve. I talked about this earlier. Uh, you know, business like charities um, may actually say, you know what, I, I'm not going to take a risk. I'm going to make sure that I've got, say, you know, three, four, five months money in the bank so that actually if I need to wind down the business, I've got enough to pay everything off without having to go bust in the process. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think probably we've covered uh, most of those um, those those points on that slide. Everybody comfortable with that? I don't know if anybody's done any scenario planning um, or, or come across people who haven't scenario planned and then suddenly found themselves with, with issues. Richard, would you like to, would you like to comment on that? Have you found that at all? Oh, this is at the front end of where I get involved. I don't generally get involved until the receiver has been appointed and I'm generally the boots on the ground disposing of the assets. So this is this this is stuff that should be taking place to prevent me getting involved in the first place. Mm. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And Andrews, is that where they would is that what your ideal client looks like to you? Somebody that would come and seek your advice before they get into a situation where yeah. they're obviously having to go to, to Richard or yourself, you know, at the at, when 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 it's too late. Yeah, you know, and, and it's really interesting because um, people who do the work that I do um, have the, the skill set has developed over the last probably 15 years. And um, so our, our focus is, is now much more on actually trying to prevent failure um, and to and to be able to manage it going uh, going forward to try and help the business to recover rather than actually um, as perhaps was in the past where we, we would simply be consulted when it, when it was too late and there was the only option was for the company to go into uh, administration or liquidation or receivership and, and, and the assets get sold. Mm. It still is the case that actually you might find that part of a recovery plan is that if you've got a big business, one bit of it actually might need to go if it's dragging down the rest. We had a situation last year where um, we were advising a pub that also had a, a brewery uh, attached to it. They were doing their, their own beer. Um, the brewery had never made any money. It was dragging down the other business. Um, and it was just they, they just couldn't make that work uh, with where it was, what the rent was, etc. So we, we, we set up a strategy for them to be able to get rid of the brewery, uh, to be able to put the, the bar into almost special measures um, where it could actually talk to its creditors and say, you know what, we just need to sort of step back from this and we need to control our cash flow, but we'll recover because the bar is in a really good place in London. Um, even even you know in in COVID times, it was still managing to, uh, to 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 serve people outside and get a good a good revenue coming through. So the bar will be fine. We just had to get rid of the bit that was pulling it down. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that you know Richard might find that sort of scenario as well, where actually, for example, if you've got a a, a chain of hotels 
and, uh, and, and some of them are good, uh, you know, revenue generators. Some of them actually are in bad locations or aren't doing very well or perhaps need a, a load of refurbishment. Uh, and you can find that actually, you know, maybe a receiver needs to be appointed over two or three of the hotels that aren't in a good shape, but actually you allow the rest of them to, to flourish. Uh, and the uh, and and use the money that's generated by good hotels to make them even better, rather than having uh, the whole lot dragged down by unprofitable elements. Absolutely, and and, and it's prevention, isn't it? I think the key word. And I, thank goodness, I think we're actually stepped now into a culture which is more about prevention. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that's a cultural change, isn't it, that we're seeing? Yeah. You know. Around. It definitely is, and and and, and in the um, in the early nineties, there was a recession where um, where, where actually the, uh, the 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 attitude of the banks at the time, because it was such a severe recession, was actually we just need to get our money back, and 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 so you know they appointed receivers left, right, and center. They you know they they uh, it, it was really horrendous time, and coming out of that, everybody learned from that. So when you came through to the financial crash that we had in two thousand and eight, uh, actually there wasn't a huge amount of business failure coming out of that because the banks were really yeah. trying to work with businesses and turn them around. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So, um, pivoting, uh, we've talked about uh, this a, a lot over the last uh, eighteen months, and I think it's still still very much the case. You know, we're still all having to really gear up and make sure that uh, you know we are. Uh, future-proofing our businesses by diversifying into digital uh, um, situations uh, as much as possible. So I'm not going to dwell on that. I can see the time is marching on. Um, just a, a quick point about communication there, crisis. Um, really, I, I always say, you know, that the communication is, is king. And, and just as we were talking before about, you know, not necessarily burying your head in the sand, not necessarily talking to people. I think it's really important that actually the right messages get out. Um, so so there are different stakeholders. We've listed a few of them just to pick a couple out. Uh, you know, what about employees? If, if the business is facing a bit of a crisis, do you tell your employees knowing that they may go off and, and try and seek new jobs? Uh, particularly in the current market, um, or do you actually just try and sort of, you know, um, button down and, and and keep them in the dark? And it's a real fine balance. Um, you know, I, I once had to wind up a business in, uh, in the middle of December, two weeks from Christmas. You know, the employees were not happy that they got left uh, until that point without knowing anything about it. So it's a real fine balance and uh, every situation is different. Um, suppliers and landlords. Um, you know, they, they quickly know if they're not being paid that there's something up um, and, and they will get, you know, they will get quite aggressive at times um, about collecting their money. So it is a stressful area, but sometimes you just need to talk through what that messaging is uh, and be honest as you possibly can with people, because generally, especially at the moment, uh, you know, a supply is not necessarily going to want to lose a customer if they're just having some temporary difficulties. Um, not talking to them will annoy them, it'll destroy that trust, um, but you need to gauge sort of exactly what you do say to them. Banks we've talked about, shareholders and other investors, important to keep them up to date with what's going on. And actually externally, uh, you know, there are PR agencies out there which actually deal with crisis management. Um, I hadn't come across this until a few years ago, but actually there are business, there are um, PR companies that that really uh, actually will, especially with bigger businesses, you know, they will advise them exactly what to say, um, you know, what positive messaging to put out, even if the business uh, is going through difficult times. Um, and, and what we also say is communication within a board of directors is really important and recording their decision making is absolutely crucial absolutely crucial uh, to make sure that if if the company does go bust and uh, a liquidator is looking at the conduct of the directors afterwards that uh, you know everybody knows what they did and why they did it um, i'm going to move on from from this one because I, I can see that we've uh, we've only got um, a short amount of time left. I just wanted to talk about the re relaxation of insolvency measures. So during COVID, 
the government has basically prevented uh, from companies from being wound up. Um, and they've given, they gave directors a, a, a bit of an easy time uh, to be able to continue to run their companies without fear of, of sort of what might happen if they, if they went bust or they didn't, for example, pay the revenue. Um, so so uh, company directors have been able to, to trade on, even if they knew that they were making losses, which in normal circumstances can be uh, a worrying time. But um, all of that is coming to an end now. And certainly from the end of September, um, companies can now bring winding up petitions against companies that haven't paid. Um, so if there's a debt there, for example, owed to HMRC uh, from the 1st of October, they can present a winding up petition in court. And, and that's, we were talking earlier, Kelly, about, you know, what's the future holding? I think that is going to be um, quite a, a, an interesting scenario because I think the courts are going to be flooded um, with winding up petitions against companies, which is just going to increase the pressure um, in, in, in the business environment. So, you know, I don't want to anticipate lots of lots of winding up, but I think I think the pressure on businesses is going to be building quite quickly. Uh, from yeah, I, I mean, we were talking about it pause me, Andrew, and 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 just saying that, and actually, some of the businesses that perhaps might you know might have actually not been here, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, um, through the government's um, loans and yeah. what they've offered, have actually been able to continue and continue with their business. So. Um, yeah, yeah. We're gonna, I think we're going to see those, unfortunately, you know. Yeah, and, and I think that there is also a, um, a, a worrying thing out there, which is that the government has got it into its head that actually if a company goes bust, then uh, they kind of naturally assume that the directors have benefited from the money that hasn't been paid to the revenue. Mm. Um, and, and so there's legislation that's been brought in which allows the revenue to actually go after directors uh, themselves personally much more easily uh, for, for what would otherwise be you know, business related liabilities. Um, I saw a situation recently where one of our clients, uh, a charity actually, uh, they owed quite a lot of money to the, to the government. Um, they owed about half a million pounds to the government, um, partly due to COVID, partly due to issues that they had before. And they got a, a, a letter from the, from the revenue, which basically said to the company and to the trustees of this charity, um, we want £350,000 from you within four weeks. And it wasn't just the company, it was personally against the trustees of the charity as well. So you can imagine that put the, uh, the cat among the pigeons because companies have generally got limited liability and directors don't have to pay that. Um, that, you know, for the liabilities of the company. But if the revenue were going to start targeting directors personally for company liabilities, then, you know, that's, uh, that's quite worrying. Yeah. And definitely something for people to be aware of. Um, just, just very quickly, um, I think uh, this is just the final bit of this. Just really, um, this is a, 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 Chinese, um, a Chinese saying, which is, in a time of danger, it's also a time for opportunity. And it's just really to say that there are opportunities out there, uh, you know, for if, if, if Richard go, goes in and, and is having to sell a business, uh, sell, sell a property, um, then clearly, you know, that's, a, that's a, an opportunity arising out of uh, a failure. Uh, and we find that all the time, you know, that uh, businesses that need that restart where actually there's a good underlying business. It's a great opportunity for somebody coming along if they've got the money to be able to buy uh, a business. So it's uh, so we, it's something that we 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 very much focus on, and we've had the discussion within Creston Reeves of actually small business owners may be aware that you know that there are competitors or there are suppliers or customers that they come across, you know, where actually they could really do with getting together with another business, whether it's a merger, whether it's an acquisition, but at the smaller level, they don't necessarily know how to do that. Uh, and that's something that that we really need to be aware of as, as accountants uh, to, to help our clients to be able to say, OK, you know, do have a look around. It's not as difficult as you think it might be. Um, and if you if you think that you, you should merge with another business or, or buy another business because it's a great opportunity, talk to us about it. Talk to a bank about it because we may be able to make it happen. 
Absolutely. And of course, that's where the chamber, that's where the chamber is, you know, the chamber of commerce um, is, is so, it's such a great opportunity for small, medium businesses, um, because of course it provides that environment for exactly yeah. that. Exactly. That, that, you know, that, that conversation that, um, you know, if, if there can be trust between businesses, uh, you know, where, where a business owner who is having difficulty says, you know what, I could really do with sort of hooking up with another business partner, getting some investment into the business. You know, it's, it's really a time of, of, of opportunity uh, that, that, that people should be able to seize. And we know that private equity investors are going to be out there looking um, in a vulture type way and trying to pick up businesses that are in difficulties. And, yeah. uh, you know, businesses that, that, that interact are probably in a much better place to be able to make that happen. Absolutely, Andrew. Cool. Is, is there anything anybody wants to ask? I know we're, we're running very short of time now. Um, are, there, are there any burning questions anybody wants to ask before we, yeah. before we finish? I think Kaz has got a couple of questions to yeah, uh, put forward from, from businesses within the Chamber. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Andrew. Always interesting. I'm acutely aware of time, uh, so so won't prevail un unnecessarily on our, our guest time. I've got two businesses that weren't able to attend, sadly, today, but both had points on the same topic. One company uh, is a third generation janitorial cleaning company. So they've been going a very, very long time. The impact of COVID was that many of the facilities they serviced simply closed down. The other is a 20 year old coffee vending machine business who once again were in impacted by offices and facilities so the same problem the question that they're looking at and it's both of them is they are very in terms of their due diligence they review their terms and conditions what they're saying is that the companies that they service that were their clients paid commercial rates paid their insurances paid their rent but they these two companies both gallantly gave contract holidays to the organizations. They're now coming up to review their T's and C's and they want to inbuild into the T's and C's uh, a clause which says that if the client is forced to close down for whatever reason beyond the provider's control, how can they impose those very rigorous T's and C's and would that be a way to go the reason being both of them had contingency both of them had war chests for six seven months so these are not flyby companies that that went from one month to the next sadly some of our chamber members you know they don't know where their next mortgage payment w w will come from and that's no criticism it could be that they're embryonic couldn't it Kelly or yeah. it could be that there simply wasn't the reserve but both of these companies diligently had war chests. The janitorial company had 30 odd staff. The coffee machine company has 14. So large amounts of staff. What would your view be to building in, I think you called it, wind down reserve in mm. placing at renewal much, much stricter T's and C's to help them? Gosh, uh interesting point uh so i think that i mean obviously within within normal contract terms you would generally have a notice period um so uh, thinking back to last year you know you you for example the, the janitorial company um you know it, it it's um its services were suspended because businesses weren't going into the offices and therefore they didn't need cleaning um, and, and and so what's the position there? Presumably, you know, they they were asking for a suspension of the of the contract um, with with the janitorial company rather than to, to terminate it. So I, I guess that in normal circumstances, you might have a notice period that might be a week. It might be a month uh, for janitorial services. Um, so so the difficulty that they've got is that. Uh, you know, the clients could just terminate and and they would only have that week uh, to pay. 
what they might consider, I guess, is actually putting in some sort of suspension of service terms so that um, uh, uh, so that they they try and make it attractive or necessary for a client to say, actually, we just want to suspend you and we will pay some sort of, you know, perhaps smaller contribution towards costs during that time so that it gives them some sort of income, some sort of uh, mitigation of the loss that they would suffer by having to pay their people, but they've got no income coming in. Mm. So I, I think that would probably, it would be building in that sort of suspension clause of what the terms might be around that. Um, because otherwise they're, they're in a position where, you know, they may just be given notice by the clients and, and, and then they've got to hope that they get the contract again when the client restarts. So yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's a really good answer, Andrew, um, because, yeah, like, Kaz, I mean, do you want to wrap up with Andrew? Yes, uh, thank you for that. I'll go back to both companies and, uh, and give them your name. With both companies, they actually hired out equipment. So with the janitorial service, they, they installed their own hand blowers and electronic devices. And with the coffee machine company, they hired them out, the actual um, latte machines or yep. uh, machines so these products still remained within the business but were uh non-fee earning for for want of a better word so what perhaps i could go back to them and say is well what is the cost of the basic equipment without the service mm. and build that nominal sum into um but i'll go back to them and and let them know that that might be uh, a way forward but yeah. just just to reassure people both of these companies were diligent you know, they both had war chests in terms of contingency, but nobody expected this to go on. But what both of them are feared of is having exhausted their contingency. If we go into another lockdown, what would happen then? Uh, I know it's an unanswerable question and, and you've been very fair in, in your response and very relatable. So I'll go back to them. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank Ellie. If anybody Thank wants to talk to me on it, very happy to chew the cud. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Andrew. I think it's time to wrap up now um, for, for the time. Thank you ever so much for those who have attended. Um, of course, as I said, this will be going on to uh, our YouTube channel as well and across social media. Um, it's been really, really interesting, actually, Andrew. Um, really good topic and it, you've delivered it very, very well. Um, so thank you very much for coming on and sharing that valuable knowledge, um, which I'm sure businesses and directors will find, yeah, it, you know, to enhance them, you know, yeah. um, and let's get them coming to you before they get to that position. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Have the conversation early. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Good. yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Have a lovely week. Um, I have got Biddington wine tasting on Thursday. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to come to that, please do. Um, you can get your tickets to come on on the Kenton Big Chamber website. So yeah, thank you. Have a good day, everyone, and I will see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.